Tonight is a night for storytelling, and so, and the chief reminded us of some of the stories from his nation. And so I'm going to begin with something that resonated, a quote from uh, a member of the West Moberly First Nations, a man by the name of Dean Doki. And it, this quote really resonated with me. I remember my father telling me stories about places in our territory. Every area had a story because it was our land. You remember the land by the stories. And when you go to the area, you add your own story. Through storytelling, we carry forward the history of our people. Removal of this part of our culture and lifestyle has altered our identity. How then shall we live? We are all treaty people. But what does a treaty mean when the lands and the waters are devastated for resource extraction purposes, in this case, Site C Dam? How do Indigenous people continue to tell their stories and practice their cultural traditions, traditions that go back thousands of years without the beautiful Peace River Valley? How then shall we live? Some have said any economic development plan that destroys or damages entire watersheds is an example of cultural genocide. For when you destroy the land, you destroy the culture of the people directly connected to the land. But maybe that was the intention all along. In spite of the good work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the noble aspirations of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, too many of our leaders are not connecting the dots. And if truth be told, and I know in this place tonight, alternative facts do not exist, too many Canadians believe they can continue building mega dams while trampling on Indigenous rights. How then shall we live? So let us begin. Each of our panelists will have about 10, 15 minutes to explore this question. What does it mean when we say we are all treaty people and how then shall we live? Speaking first will be Chief Roland Wilson, who, if you're just joining us tonight, I'll give a little background information. He's the chief of the West Moberly First Nations from Treaty 8. He sits on several boards and councils, including the BC First Nations Energy and Mining Council, the BC First Nations Gaming Committee, the Pacific Trails Pipeline First Nations Limited Partnership, and the Northeastern, Northeast Aboriginal Business and Wellness Center. Phew, he's a busy man. Chief Wilson is a prolific presenter and a powerful one, too. In recent years, he has made numerous presentations at various forums and seminars concerning issues important to First Nations, including the duty to consult, Aboriginal land and resource management, and the impacts of the oil and gas and shale industries on First Nations in northeastern BC. And, as has been mentioned earlier today, on January 15th, the West Moberly and Prophet River First Nations filed notices of civil claim in which they claimed that the mega project will in Site C Dam will infringe on their treaty rights and, quote, fails to uphold the honor of the Crown. The nations also seek an injunction to prevent any future construction at Site C on the Peace River, seven kilometers southwest of south of Fort St. John. Uh, Chief Lynette Sakosa of the Prophet River First Nation is also here with us tonight, and I would like her to stand and be officially recognized by everyone here. Thank you. Art Napoleon, who you've seen on the stage here already, is another member of this panel, and this comes from his website. I'm not, I didn't write this. Art is a former chief of the Salto First Nations. Walking in two worlds, he is as comfortable on a big city stage or boardroom as he is skinning a moose in a hailstorm with a pocket knife. Woo! <laughs> Tapping into rich and profound ancestral knowledge to create sustainable and ethical alternatives for the modern world are the foundations that guide him in his many projects. Art is a conservationist, naturalist, faith keeper, and educator who interprets life through the holistic lens of Cree worldview. 
Art is also a budding TV personality with a growing resume in the film industry and is known as an on-stage humorist with an uncanny ability to improvise and engage audiences of all ages, including children and youth. And I think we've seen some of that here already. Currently based in Victoria, Art remains connected to his home territory and his Indigenous roots. And then our third member of the panelist, panel is Brenda Dragon, who is a member of Smith's Landing First Nations and is from Fort Smith Northwest Territories. She is an Indigenous tourism consultant and president of Aurora Heat Incorporated. She is an entrepreneur who is collaborating with her famous fur trapping mother, Jane Dragon, to share the comforting warmth of sheared beaver fur with people all over the world. Dragon has an economic vision for the North that is grounded in the traditional economies of the Northwest Territories. In addition to running her own business, Brenda is a member of the Slave River Coalition, an organization that promotes holistic public engagement with the Slave River. Through traditional recreational and educational activities, their projects and initiatives support the social, environmental, and economic sustainability of the watershed. Sounds like a vision of economic development most of us in this room could get behind. Brenda is a water protector and we're pleased she was able to be with us here tonight to share her story and her wisdom. And so, we will begin first with the Chief Roland. And again, we are all treaty people. How then shall we live? You want to speak here or um, whatever you like? I could speak there, I guess. Okay. Should I speak there? I think they'd probably prefer that. <laughs> And then when we do the questions. I'm a high-tech Indian. I got to use something here. I want to share something with everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I want to again thank everybody for um, coming out and, and supporting us and supporting the cause. Um, it's, it's rather uh, overwhelming. <clears throat> a couple of things. I want to cry. <laughs> I'm tired, and uh, especially tired of having to come down here and do this stuff. But... Um, Hopefully I, I'm, I don't swear too much. Uh, I, I probably will cry. And uh, um, hopefully we'll laugh a little bit. <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm overwhelmed that you guys get a standing ovation for us. And, uh, you know, it's hard to... I don't do this for that, you know. Um, I'm the chief of the West Mobley First Nations. I've been elected by my people to be a spokesperson uh, in, in the old ways of the Dinosaur well, people, there were headmen, and those headmen took care of their community, and that's what's been granted to me. I'm supposed to be the person that, you know, comes down here and does this for them. Um, I appreciate you standing and, and acknowledging me and Chief Lynette for coming down here. Um, it's just, it feels weird <laughs> to, to have that happen. Um, I don't even know what the question was anymore. So I, I want to share something with you that somebody shared with me. I'm not, give me a minute here, and I'll try and get through it. I'm not the best reader in the world. Um, this is something that guides me, and, and I, I share it with whoever I can when I can. Our deepest fear is that we are not inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us most. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and famous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in all of us. And when we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fears, our presence automatically liberates others. When I first became chief, that was posted on my door of my office. And I took, it's on my desktop on my computer. It's been on there ever since. Holy cow, why am I choked up? <laughs> <Okay. clears throat> 
what I see here now with everybody that's come up here and said what they had to say and everybody in this room, you are given that presence. You're allowing your light to shine. Um, and I thank you for that. <laughs> Trivia question? Who said that? Yes, but at, at who stood up? And it was Nelson Mandela. He stood after being in prison for 27 years. He got elected as a, a president of South Africa, and he, that was his inaugurational speech. You know? um, so it, to me, it's, uh, I have it on my, I read it every day when I start my computer up uh, on my laptop. So it's again overwhelming that uh, listening to everybody come here and talk today, um, you know, uh, Dr. Harry Swain, uh, Robert McCullough, um, Seth, Seth, right? Uh, on the first panel. Uh, well, how the hell can you make that decision to go forward after you listen into that? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. None of it makes sense. That's the problem. When I look at this thing, you've got all the First Nations in Treaty 8 have been opposed to Site C. Now, we heard earlier that there's some that have agreements. Um, and I, I want to clarify this. Uh, there are four First Nations in Treaty 8 that have signed agreements. There's one First Nation that's actually promoting the agreement. The other three nations um, signed. None of those other nations are standing up supporting Site C. Um, one of them has actually came out and stated that they felt they had no choice. So when you hear about free prior and informed consent, free is the key there. You have to make your decision. You have to be free to make that decision. Those nations were not free to make those decisions. The decision was made to build Site C, and they felt they had no other choice to do but uh, try and get something out of it. West Wobbly and Prophet River has stood strong. I, I appreciate and honor Prophet River for, for standing with us. Uh, you know, we're standing together on this fight. But there are eight nations in Treaty 8 BC. Not four, there's eight. West Wobley and Prophet River have stated that we are not in favor of Site C. Um, we're not saying that no to everything, we're saying Site C is a bad idea. It's, it's more important to save that valley, maintain our way of life, protect the treaty, uh, than it is to destroy it for no reason. Blueberry River First Nations is in court right now. Pretty soon here, they're having their court date uh, being heard. They're taking the province of British Columbia to court over cumulative impacts, and part of those cumulative impacts is Site C. They've identified that in their re report, uh, their court action. Fort Nelson First Nations has never retracted the letter stating that they were not in favor of Site C. BC has never engaged with them on that. Uh, Fort Nelson has, they're still not in favor of Site C. So you have four nations opposed to Site C. Three of them are in court. You got one First Nation standing up and three First Nations that have signed agreements forcibly, you know, um, under duress, I would say, uh, with that. So when you look at it, none of it's been free prior and informed consent. West Wobble and Prophet River have never given them consent. We've told them right off, the, right off in the very beginning in our first sit-down meeting, you do not have free prior informed consent from us. We do not agree with this project. There's other things to do here. We would like to have that discussion. We never got to that point. There are also 14 nations downstream of Site C um, in Alberta, in the Northwest Territories. We've heard about the uh, Athabasca, uh, Athabasca Delta. Those 14 nations have just recently resubmitted a letter stating that they're not in favor of Site C. They are opposed to Horgan's approval of the dam. Nobody's talking to those people over there. You know, um, W.A.C. Bennett created the Wilson Reservoir and destroyed a massive tract of territory in our, in our backyard. But it also did a massive pile of damage in the, Alberta, uh, in the Athabasca um, Delta. Did I say that earlier? Or did I? Yeah, the Athabasca Delta. And... Um, They've never had a discussion with anybody on that. You know, Site C represents a third dam on the, on the Peace River, and 
what we have said right from the very beginning as, as uh, West Mobley and, and Prophet Rivers, that we're not opposed to the creation of the energy. What we're opposed to is the unnecessary destruction of the valley. They don't have to destroy that valley in order to create this energy. You heard today the first panel was very clear on that. There's absolutely no need for it. Uh, the joint review panel, uh, Harry Swain sat on the joint review panel and uh, as the chair of the joint review panel stated, BC Hydro has not made their case for Site C. In the first go around in 1980, uh, uh, when the BC UC uh, uh, sent Site C back, they told them you haven't made your case for Site C, there's no need for it. If you want to move forward on something, you should be looking at geothermal energy. They haven't done that. You know, they came out and said geothermal is too expensive. Well, okay, tell us why it's too expensive. They never did any report. They didn't do any study. They just threw that out there and every, lots of people went, oh, it's too expensive. We just, we won't do that. Um, we heard today, geothermal is not too expensive. Right now, there's two geothermal par, uh, projects approved in, in British Columbia under the standing offer program. Uh, BC Hydro has a, a standing offer program. is 15, I think it's 15 megawatts or less on that. <clears throat> Vailmont and Pemberton. Those two are geothermal projects. I have read through their reports, right, their feasibility studies, and I've talked to the people that are proposing those uh, projects, and I have been told by them that if they were allowed to fully develop to the potential of what that geothermal uh, opportunity was, between the two of them there would be over 405 megawatts of power baseline firm power being developed. They're only allowed to develop, I think, five or six megawatts each on that. That's half of what Site C is going to generate. And two projects and two communities, that could use the energy, right? could use the jobs. You know, um, We hear today uh, about this proposed idea of selling the power from Site C to the Yukon territory. When we started this whole process, Campbell said we need to have power for 14, uh, 400,000 homes in British Columbia. The Minister of Energy at that time, Richard Neufeld, went around the province and told everybody, if we don't build Site C, we're going to have to have rolling brownouts throughout the province. And you're going to have to decide when you turn your lights off and turn your heat off in your house. Because that's what's going to happen if we don't build Site C. Lied to the, everybody. And that's fear mongering. You know, what the hell? Sorry. Is that, I don't know, is that a swear word? Okay. Um, my canoe left too. <laughs> the, the, the whole auspice of what Site C is to represent was it started as 400,000 homes. Well, we understand through the Columbia Treaty process, once they allocate the power to something, they don't want to unallocate it. They have got more than enough energy in the Alberta, uh, in the Columbia River Treaty to overcompensate for what Site C would have there. But they have a treaty in place, they don't want to offend the treaty. That's kind of funny. <laughs> in light of everything going on, they uphold the treaty, um, I guess because that makes them money or something, um, but if they build Site C, if they sell the power to the Yukon government to help them, when we need the power, are they going to cancel the agreement they have with the Yukon government and make that power British Columbian power? I don't think so. Their action doesn't show that that's what they will do. They were trying to sell it to the Alberta tar sands. Uh, Christy Clark was over in Alberta trying to, she was trying to sell it to anybody that could buy it. And nobody wanted it. But we know that if they sign an agreement with them, they're not going to unsign the agreement. They're not going to cancel it because they've made a commitment to them. You know, and it, it, they don't seem to want to break those commitments, but breaking commitments to us doesn't seem to be an issue. Our, our way of life is important to us. It's who we are as a people. We are people of the land. You cannot take us off the land. As you've seen with uh, Helen and her, her, her poem, 
that she, she did there. We've been here 500 years. We're not going away. In, not, in actual reality, we've been on the ground in, in the Peace Valley for over 10,000 years. Our ancestors hunted the mammoth that walked on the ground there. We have oral history stories of hunting animals that when they walked by with long noses and big white teeth, they shook the ground in massive herds. Well, that was our people hunting mammoth in the valley. We're still there today. You can talk to Ken Boone when they were, when they were tilling up their yards and their gardens. They were finding arrowheads, spearheads, all kinds of stuff. It's all littered through the valley. And that's because the valley was a highway for us. We traveled the valley. That's how we moved around. Um, Damien, as, as, uh, his family, has a history in Goldbar. You know, when they flooded uh, uh, Williston Reservoir, his family got flooded out of there. They were a ranching, a ranch, they owned a big ranch down there and they, they lost their ranch. Well, right from there, all the way up there, the, on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, we had camps, we had grave sites, we had spiritual sites all through there. They're all underwater now. There was a caribou migration that happened across the Peace River. Thousands of caribou. Uh, are, we did a study and, and the study showed that there was, the elders said they were like bugs on the landscape. When they fought at Wilson Reservoir, it fragmented that caribou migration pattern and it separated them and created a northern population and a southern population. In 2010, there was 425 caribou in the southern population. There is over 2,000 First Nations that live in the southern part of Treaty 8 territory, I believe, between Soto First Nation, there's too many of them. <laughs> there's 1,300, something like that. Uh, West Wobley, 300. Um, McLeod Lake, you know, uh, we're close to two, around close to 2,000. How do we share 425 caribou? How do you do that? How do you feed your family? on 425 caribou. Just quick math, for West Mobley, we have 300, over 300 members. Families of five, which is not a, a big family, it's a pretty small family, but a family of five. Um, a caribou is not very big. It's a little bit larger than a, a big deer, uh, around the size of a big deer. Uh, not much meat, dressed out probably 200, maybe, maybe a big one, be 300 pounds of meat. It doesn't take very long for a family of five to eat that. So you need a couple of caribou, you know, and you, could, you have a couple of moose, you have a couple of elk, you know, you have this, you don't just eat one thing, you eat, you eat it all in a seasonal round is what, what it's called. You hunt the caribou at the time when the, it's all right to hunt the caribou, you hunt the moose when it's all time right to hunt the moose, you know, and you leave them alone during their calving season. When they're, when they're in their rut, you know, you leave them alone. You allow them to go. We don't hunt the big bulls. We leave the big bulls alone. So 425 caribou, and what did I say, 2010? That's not a lot of caribou. Well, 2016, the provincial biologist put out a report, there's 219 caribou left in the South Peace. We thought we were, we have a caribou action plan, we're working on recovering the caribou. West Mobley and Soto First Nations have a caribou penning program. It's the only, it's the most successful program in, in Canada, we found out. Um, there was 19 caribou left in the, in the Moberly herd, the Quincy's R herd, right behind our community. And uh, we took action, got a plan in place, set up a pen, started catching pregnant caribou. And, uh, well, we started catching caribou where they were pregnant. It was kind of lucky. We didn't know that they were lucky. We had to test them and stuff. We did that in conjunction with, with the province. That herd right now is at 70 caribou. But that's the only herd that's there. All of them are dwindling. We're watching the caribou disappear off our land, a staple that used to feed our, our communities for eons, you know, like just disappear. And, and the province is like, well, you know, we don't eat the caribou. You, you like the caribou, but you can have one caribou. That's what we get. We get to share one caribou in a ceremonial fashion, which the Dunnies uh, don't use meat in ceremonial fashions. You know, they don't take the time to understand who we are as a people. Uh, I'm just babbling on here. Holy cow. What was I supposed to be talking about? <laughs> Sight C, that's right. Anyway, it goes back to Sight C. 
All the fish in the Williston Reservoir are full of methylmercury. They are argued for years that they need to reduce the, the warning on the methylmercury. We run a test, uh, a study on the, the fish, uh, I believe 2014, that showed all the fish that we caught, we tested them uh, in a third party laboratory, independent testing on them, and it came back that all the fish have more mercury than they are supposed to have. So the mercury issue isn't going down, it's somehow coming up. And we don't know what the cause of that is. Nobody's looked at what the effects of having a massive body of water, like a reservoir sitting where a, re a river is supposed to be, pushing down on the ground. Well, it's probably pushing stuff up that shouldn't be there. We heard earlier that the, the mercury issue for the, the um, uh, Site C reservoir is not supposed to be that big of an issue. Well, I would beg to differ. We don't know. You know, uh, Dr. Jill Wendling, a renowned water specialist and an expert on dams, did a study for us and said they don't have anywhere near enough information to go ahead and build a dam. They don't know what the ground conditions are, what the water conditions are around there on that. So for them to say, well, there's not going to be an issue in methylmercury, I don't think that's true, you know. They're saying what they think they need to say in order to get approval, uh, you know, uh, buyer's consent to, to continue to move forward. And it's not something that we're in favor of, you know. We should be looking at new technology as a, as a country, as Canada, as BC, as beautiful British Columbia magazine comes out, we should be looking at geothermal energy. This is the way of the future, solar energy. Uh, we just had a meeting in Vancouver with this, these guys talking about new opportunities in solar. The technology is increasing tenfold every year in solar. That's a benign energy that's just every day the sun shines, you can gather that energy. This is a weird thing. Solar guys don't talk to wind guys. The two of them don't like each other. They don't talk to each other. We came up with this, I, I, we thought it was a pretty cool idea. Why don't you put solar panels on the wind towers? So, it, you know, you're collecting solar and wind at the same time. Well. You think we were trying to cut their left arm off. <laughs> they, had, they had wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, and, and it was, it was, to us it was, well, why wouldn't you do that? Like, that wouldn't make sense. Wouldn't you be able to generate even more? The wind doesn't blow all the time. The sun doesn't shine all the time. Combine the two of them on there. You know, nobody is doing geothermal. Like, the province isn't looking at geothermal. They're looking at these little tiny projects. We heard that the, they're going to rejig re the, the standing offer program and allow First Nations to be included in the standing offer program. Standing offer program was uh, 15 megawatts, I believe, 15 or 17 megawatts of power, which is, which is a lot. Uh, uh, my understanding is one megawatt will provide enough power for 400 homes over, over the life of the megawatt for the year. Um, they've rejigged it to allow the First Nations participation in the standing offer program, the clean energy, down to kilowatt hours. Not megawatts, kilowatts. They dropped it down. You know, so we can, we can generate one or two megawatts. Everyone else is allowed to generate 15 megawatts. You know, that, oh, why? <laughs> why is that? I don't understand why that is. You know, you sit there and you think about this and try and understand, how did we get to this decision? Nothing about this decision makes any sense. Nothing about it. It doesn't make financial sense. It doesn't make sense on an on a, on a, uh, environmental footprint sense. Uh, you know, it, we don't need the power. But here we are spending $12 billion. And it seems complacency is winning on this thing. You know, we're here fighting. But, you know, we should be in that back gym auditorium and the room should be full. There, like people need to understand what's going on here, and they're not. We've got people out there making noise and, and reporting some good stuff out there, but for some strange reason, people just don't seem to care. You know, and our, we know our bills are going to be going up. The First Nation bills are through the roof already. We can't understand that. We, we're trying to find out from BC Hydro why are, why are our brand new houses that we built on reserve why are members that, like, small families have two people living in a house with 
$1,800 hydro bills. Why is that? What's going on? They won't give us any information. You know, are we getting a different rate because we live on reserve? Or, or is West Moby getting a different rate because I'm down here doing this and they're mad? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's strange. I could keep going, but I'm not. I want to stop. Yeah, there's two others. There's no blinking lights or anything, so nobody's telling me to stop. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, shout out to my cousin up there, cousin. Um, and everyone else, come on. Thank you. I've got some really deep thoughts here. Um, so this will be quick. <clears throat> With those lights shining there, this is what deer feel like in the white man's hunting season up in Treaty 8. <laughs> so uh, the question was, how are we all treaty people? We are all treaty people. Well, not till I get my five bucks and my cows and plows. Thank you. I'm not sharing that. <laughs> to me, if we're all treaty people, uh, it's related to this word that's been uh, bandied about all year called uh, reconciliation. Uh, but with a big word like that, people have to actually, governments have to be able to put their money where their mouth is. Their actions have to match the talk. And that's not really happening. You have to back up and look at the big picture because if you just focus on that dam, and even if you were victorious in your fight to stop it, there'll be another dam popping up somewhere else. So the fight is going to continue elsewhere, and there'll be, whole, there'll be another united church full of people like this. <laughs> so you have to back up and look at the bigger question, and that really is one of the system, really one of capitalism, really one of cumulative impacts. Uh, the, uh, the, the cumulative impacts in the Northeast are incredible. Some of you who have had the chance to, to hear Caleb talk about, about that, you have, you have some idea. It's, uh, parts of it do look like an industrial wasteland, and uh, the, the funny thing is uh, the South benefits from that. Our voting population is quite low up there, so it seems that it's easier for the government to get away with it in a place like that. They wouldn't get away with this uh, some of these activities if they were happening near in the lower mainland. So this is a great opportunity, I think, for all Canadians to um, begin to question. You know, the pendulum is supposed to swing back to the left. In this case, they, it just stayed over there. <laughs> it's supposed to swing back. It's supposed to be about balance, right? And leftists don't talk to leftists. The right they, they tend to be more organized. <laughs> they may not agree on everything, but they sit down and strategize and, and they work together and the left has to learn to do the same darn thing. And at the same time, I think uh, we're at an age now where Canada can continue to go the same way it has been. Uh, we've exported everything. We've exported all of our, our, our raw resources instead of doing some manufacturing of our own in Canada, instead of creating some value-added opportunities, everything gets sold <laughs> to the highest bidder, basically. And I didn't realize that um, until I started traveling overseas as a young man that some people did not really see, they don't really see Canada as a developed country. Did you know that? <laughs> because we're absolutely dependent on exports, and if that ever stopped, we wouldn't have anything except what's left out there, and that's declining really fast. So Canada, BC, you're at a crossroads. You have to find a new way to move forward and, and, and something that, with something that is actually balanced, with something that is actually sustainable, and people are kind of lost because all we have had is the capitalist model top-down old boys network, the old hierarchy. It's not working anymore, and that's, but that's the only model people have had. People tend to think when it comes to political frameworks in black and white, oh, they're doing that, they must be commies. <laughs> 
We were the original commies, I'll have you know. <laughs> if commie is about being communal, I guess I'm a commie, but uh, <laughs> there were some values that were really entrenched. First Nations values, you know, you take something from the land, you put back. No decisions are made without looking at the big picture, so it's a more holistic approach. So yes, you can make money, yes, you can be an entrepreneur, but how are your decisions affecting everything else? Because everything has to be kept into balance. You want to make sure you're not hurting your neighbors. If there's a way to minimize those damages, if there's a way to, to mitigate environmental impacts, it all becomes a part of the equation. Triple bottom line, I, I don't know, there's more than triple. You gotta look at more bottom lines than just the triple. And that's always been our way of doing things and I think that's where, um, this is a time where everybody has to come back to those values, those principles, those laws. And I say all of us because uh, a lot of our people have lost their way too they, because they've also had only the capitalist model and everybody's entrenched in their thinking and that's when there's a, when you come from a poverty stricken community and all of a sudden there's a lot of money being bandied about and you're tired of being poor, you want to benefit and you want to create something for your children so everybody's on that wagon. I don't blame everybody, they're, just, they're all trying to make a living but um, just bad timing. <laughs> <laughs> Wish that would have happened way back when they were building the Wacky Bandit Dam. So um, I think this is a time for people like us in this room to regroup and to start reframing that thinking around capitalism. What are the alternatives? How can you reshape capitalism? How can you make it a values-based system without killing uh, on the spirit of entrepreneurship and free enterprise. There has to be a balance in there. So further to this, I would say treaty people, I think uh, if you want to be treaty people, learn the territory. <laughs> learn about the territory you're on. Learn about the history. Learn about the geography. Excuse me, my cold is kicking in. Learn how to pronounce those names. Maybe even go to the bingo and set by an elder. <laughs> it's about humanizing everything. You know, uh, everything is clinical and everything is just based on so much, sorry, God, bullshit. These, these systems of economics, they, they make it sound like a science. They make it sound like a, a, a religion. <laughs> if you strip it down and look at what they're really talking about, a lot of it is BS, a lot of it is guesswork. So it's time for us to put our minds together and start questioning these things and putting forward solutions because anybody can complain, it's another thing to offer strategies and solutions and we have to be people of strategy, people who can offer solutions and uh, if we can do it all together. To me, that looks like a, a healthy form of reconciliation. Thank you. Okay. So I'm grateful and humbled to be here among all of you. Your interest and commitment is staggering, and I appreciate, every, appreciate everybody who's here. I acknowledge that we are on unceded land of the Coast Salish people, and I also respectfully acknowledge my fellow descendant members of Treaty 8. Thank you for being here. If I was to describe myself to you, I would say uh, I'm a nature-loving optimist. I believe in love. I believe in compassion and empathy. I believe the purpose of our lives is to experience happiness, which is sustained by hope. 
there's no guarantee of the future, but we, in the, we exist in the hope of something better. And that's how I ended up here, because I learned that there wasn't going to be anybody here that would represent the um, Northern Territory. And I'm from Fort Smith in the Northwest Territories. And I felt that it was important that you hear from us. I can tell you a little bit about myself. I am, my mother is Chippewan of the Athabascan tribes. Her people are from northern Saskatchewan. Uh, they've been there from time immemorial. She is fluent in, her, fluent in her language. She's a strong advocate for education and culture. Um, she has exceptional traditional skills, uh, like hides and sewing and cooking, and she's an advocate for education and culture. My father is French-Canadian. He's from northern Alberta. He's a trapper. And it goes back four generations. His father, his father's father, his great-grandfather, were all trappers in the Peace Athabasca Delta. They all had their livelihood from muskrats, beavers, and fur-bearing animals. My parents settled in Fort Smith when they were younger, just teenagers, really. I was born in Fort Smith. I come from a large family. I'm 55 years old. I was raised with appreciation of animals, land, and water. I have lived most of my life in the North. I have two children who are grown, who are raised in nature and being on the land. They are both what I would consider to be environmentalists. Um, my daughter, Chloe Dragon Smith, works tirelessly for the to purport the benefits of nature and relationships with land. She's 28 years old. I was asked to come here and when I, when I said I would come here, they had asked if I would speak about my business and I appreciate you Art, your segue into entrepreneurialism and what that's meant to me. So my father passed away six years ago and because I grew up with my father trapping and having furs in my life, I wanted to do something to honor him. Uh, none of my, my siblings are trappers, so I decided to do something with fur. And as I started to think about that, I created and designed a product and formed a corporation and am a 100% sole shareholder. And um, I have uh, a retail product, looks like this. And it's, I have fur, hand, foot, and body warmers. So these are made of sheared beaver and they're amazing in terms of their ability to trap heat. And they replace uh, um, a disposable product, which I think is very important. So it's a reusable, sustainable product. Uh, my company employs people, mostly young indigenous people. I have many retail outlets and I have a burgeoning online store and a website that I designed and I enjoy. I, um, I guess, am I successful? Um, well, it makes me happy, and I feel authentic doing it. I like my product. In fact, I love my product, and I enjoy sharing it. So when I started Aurora Heat uh, two years ago, so this is actually my second season, I, it was then that I started to think about water, because after all, beavers are aquatic animals, and I felt responsible for that. And I wanted to learn more about their habitat. I wanted to learn about their 
characteristics, because up till then I basically only saw them as they came in not living or breathing from my dad trapping. So the first thing I did when I got to Fort Smith was I joined the Slave River Coalition, and their mandate is to protect, secure, and restore the, um, the Slave River. And interestingly, um, they, they're funded almost entirely through Tides Canada, so it's not meant to be political. But we, one of the goals, and this happened prior to me joining them, was to have a water gathering. And so I became, and I helped to organize that and very quickly became the co-chair, which was mm, sort of fun. But anyway, <laughs> the water gathering was really interesting to me. There was a lot of scientists who came and they talked a lot about cumulative effects on the river and I just came to realize that there was a lot more uh, threats to the river than I had realized. The scientists uh, also gave way to people who gave traditional knowledge testimony and I was struck and I started to, to think more about my indigenous cultural world view and my connection to land animals and water and in fact the earth. At this point I'd like to show the video that we have lined up. This is from the Mikasu Cree. Um, this is just a clip from a documentary, but I chose this piece of it. I encourage you to watch it if anybody uh, is interested to see the full, you can ask me and I can give you the link. Um, but if you wanna go ahead. In the piece at the Basket Delta in Northern Alberta, Mixu elders say that water is boss. Industrial interference with the Delta's natural flooding cycle is having a profound effect on the Delta, the wildlife, and the people that depend on it. The Peace Athabasca Delta is an emerald jewel of Wood Buffalo National Park and a central component of the park's outstanding universal value. Thousands of kilometers of river channels, lakes, and sloughs make this the largest inland delta in the world. Where there is water, there is a healthy, dynamic ecosystem. Where there is water, wood bison have pristine habitat. Where there is water, there is the Mixu Cree First Nation. Like I remember that time the water was high, nice and high before the Bennett Dam. You could just go any lake you want to go, go, you know, shooting ducks, go paddling around, go, you know, any place you want to go, you could go. The Delta has begun a trend of drying since hydroelectric development and oil sands activities along the Peace and Athabasca rivers have disrupted the regular flooding of the Delta. This is why Mixu petitioned the World Heritage Committee to place Wood Buffalo National Park on the list of World Heritage in danger. A reactive monitoring mission was scheduled to visit Wood Buffalo in the fall of 2015. That summer and fall, the Peace Athabasca Delta experienced one of the most severe low water events in the collective memory of Mixu. This is a visual record of that season of intense water loss. It was important for Mixu elders to show the reactive monitoring mission what they would have seen if the mission took place in October 2015 as planned. Come with us on a journey into Wood Buffalo National Park to experience the low water levels for yourself. What's happening a lot more today? Okay, so the deltas, there's three as you go north. So the Peace Athabasca Delta, the Slave River Delta, and the um, Mackenzie Beaufort Delta. Now, the deltas are drying out, and they're under threat directly from human violation of natural and <coughs> sacred law by changing how rivers flow. I think that's a really important point 
that this is sacred law. We're not allowed, we shouldn't be, making decisions about how the earth works. It just shouldn't be. And I, I phoned, uh, so this, what you saw was in uh, Fort Chippewan, and in Fort Smith looks a lot like that. It's right, Fort Smith's right on the Alberta border. Um, I talked to Earl Evans. He's an elder, 10 years older than I am. He's 66 years old. He has been on the Slave River hunting, fishing, trapping for almost 60 years. And he's shared with me some of the changes and how that's affected his life. So it used to be that the way the water flowed, there'd be huge ice dams and they would kind of scour the land and you would have islands and inroads where you could, just as they described, you could go anywhere. Since the Bennett Dam, that has changed substantially. You have um, really, at, at some times of the year, there's just a line of river with banks. Well, there aren't any animals that come there, so it's just mud flats, and people are restricted in their livelihood and the way they, um, they hunt, the way they recreate, the way they live their lives. And one of the challenges with that, particularly for someone like Earl, who has actually spoke and went to Dawson Creek two years ago, where the then Minister Horgan of the, um, the Environment Minister was one of the moderators and continually cut people off when they were speaking. And Earl, when I talked to him, he was very frustrated by that. And they talk about free and prior consent, and that's, there was no consultation. It was simply people being asked what they thought, and that was it. There wasn't any time where uh, Earl felt that he was listened to. And when I asked him how he felt about um, what happened, and with Site C, he said, well, they don't listen to us anyway. I don't believe a word the government says because there isn't anybody that's going to protect us. Now, I'm just going to talk briefly about Site C, and, you know, I followed that. I wasn't even that aware of it, frankly, but um, when I got involved with the Slave River Coalition, I began to realize, and through also being a member of the Smith Landing Band, that this was a very serious and um, accumulative effect because the Bennett Dam, one of the things they do that's wrong is that they let the water out in the winter and they shorten it up in the spring, which is opposite of the way it should be. And that uh, has a, a profound effect all along the river systems to the Arctic Ocean. So anyway, when I saw that they the Site C and there was going to be a decision about how the, um, uh, whether the project was going ahead, I actually was quite confident that it wasn't going to go ahead. I read the, you know, I followed the, Peace, the Peel River watershed and the judicial uh, win, if you will, where that uh, allowed them um, more consultation and they shut down a lot of what was planned. I thought that was great. Then I saw the United Nations panel calling for a halt on the Site C project. And then the uh, Wood Buffalo UNESCO World Heritage Site being under threat and uh, for revoking their status and then BC's own reports that we've all undeniably heard here have uh, just didn't speak to the support of the project. And then came this stunning announcement and it was going to go ahead. And that's when everybody kind of turned to, or any of the supporters, which I believe there are a lot more than are represented, um, all turned to treaty people. And that's the way we're going to stop it. 
About that time, I also learned about a term called environmental racism. I had never heard that before. And it talks about ignoring environmental impacts based on marginalized communities for the benefit of mainstream society. So I'm part of those marginalized communities that are up the Slave River, the Athabasca Delta, the Slave River Delta, and the Mackenzie River all the way to the ocean. There's 50,000 people that live in the Northwest Territories. Most of them live along the, that waterway. The town that I live in is only 2,000 people. Fort Chippewan has 1,800 people. These are marginalized numbers of primarily Indigenous people. In closing, each and every one of us has a responsibility for ourselves, for our own footprint, for our own use and dependency on non-renewable resources, including energy. And it's like the sign says back here, all for one and one for all. Simply, our demands on the earth are why we have to fight these mega projects. We as humans are not sustainable. So from the people from the upstream, I thank you and I encourage you to keep fighting and advocating to end Site C. Three very different speakers and presentations from the heart, sharing their wisdom. I thank you so much again. Thank you. So um, I'm uh, doing an energy read, and perhaps I'm projecting, um, but my sense is that um, probably the energy needs some lifting and that another speech will probably not do that. Yeah, yeah good um, idea. And so um, <laughs> Steve Gray was going to do some of the talking strategy piece and we're going to move it in the morning but we're very very keen to get the working groups going so we're going to have to make some decisions about how we handle that but right now our suggestion I'm going to just make a few other announcements is that we go right into the music um, with our which will it'll be short but we think it'll lift the energy in the room um, so if that's I'm getting clapped so I'm assuming that works well